Welcome to the Employee Advocacy and Influence podcast. My name is Bradley Keenan. I'm the founder and CEO of the Employee Advocacy platform, Disseminate. And with me, I have the main event, Big Lou. Main event and Big Lou. Yeah. Fantastic. Honestly, this is, I feel like you're rolling out the red carpet. There's more and more with each episode. Just, I'm, I'm, just, of... I'm just a Lewis hype man. That's what I'm here for. Um, I don't know whether it's just um, Dan that calls you Big Lou or whether that's like gone all the way across the company, but he it... says it a lot. Do you know what? I told Dan when he started it, I was like, this definitely isn't going to catch on. And you called me, well, you didn't call me Big Lou. You said something on Slack the other day and you said Big at Lewis. And Dan sent it to me. He's like, I don't know if this has the same ring to it. It's Big Lou. <laughs> Big Lewis. <laughs> Big at Lewis. <laughs> but I remember when I, um, I think it was after COVID and we, because obviously we worked together before COVID and then after COVID. And then I just remember standing next to you going, I always thought you were short. I've had this so many times. Like, and I didn't know, like, have you seen um, uh, uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas? Yeah. yeah. Where he sees all waiters uh, as small. I can't so, remember that bit. But it and it's kind of it. like, I, I think this is it. He see, anyone who's serving him, he kind of sees them as, as small. And it's like showing his perspective on their kind of like role in society. Anyway, so I saw you and I was like, I can't believe you're that tall. And I didn't know whether like deep down I... I sort of felt like I looked down on you and that's why I thought you were small. I mean, <laughs> I hope not. I, no, I hope so, not because I, I don't. Was... But I was like, why would I think? Because I honestly thought you were like in the five, you know, you know, like mid fives. No, bang on six. And you, just... you know what? Because even my girlfriend didn't believe me. Yeah, uh, just when I had drive. my... When I had my BMI done, I made a point of saying to the lady who was there with me, I was just like, can I just take a photo of the thing you've just measured me on because it's very official and this is the only way my girlfriend's going to believe me. You could be stood there with a tape measure and she would be like, no, I must be holding it wonky or something like right, that. Right, so she, so she looks down on you as well. <laughs> right, that's getting cut. Right, let's get into, let's get into the <laughs> podcast. Um, so, uh, so a couple of weeks ago, we did kind of like a workshop session, which was all around the idea of uh, personas in employee advocacy and um, had a few questions about it, but specifically around uh, the idea of like, who's the ideal person inside a company to, to attract to be part of an employee advocacy program. So um, I do this on every podcast where I start to talk about sales, even though this kind of more leans to marketing, uh, but I'm going to do it one more time and it'll be the last, I promise. So in sales, we talk about our ideal client profile, right? Which is uh, the ideal person that we believe we can help with the products and service we sell. So any marketing and sales efforts we make, we point at those people who we believe we can help the most. It sounds like we're on some kind of crusade to be the nicest people in the world. Um, it's, you know, it's basic fundamentals of applying your resources in the place that's going to give you the best return. And it's the same if you're running an employee advocacy program. So uh, Lewis hasn't heard this, so we're going to kind of brainstorm it uh, on the podcast. And yeah, so we have started over the last kind of few months on our uh, client kickoff calls and also part of, part of our CS, uh, creating this idea of creating an ideal advocate profile. And it's something we started to do with some of our legacy accounts as well, where they're kind of really looking to like... Um, not reset their advocacy programs, but really kind of laser in on, you know, where they see value. So I'm going to share my screen, which is a, a first for the podcast. And for people watching, for people listening to this, uh, we're also going to put this slide as a PowerPoint file. Uh, maybe we can do it as a Google Sheet download thing as well. Um, but basically, um, you can use this, you can download it. Um, this, it's not that complicated but that's kind of why it works. So I'm hoping this is going to, sorry, I just need to move my screen around a little bit here. So I'm going to say that thing that people say all the time. Can you see that, Lewis? I just was about sure. to say you were just missing the post-lockdown essential phrase. Yeah. You know, when everybody started working hybrid and everybody started using Zoom for the first time, they were like, can you see my screen? Yeah, that's co the COVID classic. bingo 101 and oh, you're on mute. Um, <laughs> but you can see this, Lewis, for the second time on the call. I can see it, yeah. On the call, not the podcast. Um, yes, so so the ideal advocate profile. So the idea of this is that 
you build a profile of the person in your organization that you can help the most with your advocacy program, not necessarily the person that can help you the most. And the reason why you do that, uh, it's all around messaging and how you approach that person to improve the probability that they're going to join your advocacy program and become an asset um, to to the program. And, you know, we talk about the idea of it being a marketing channel, which it, which it is. The more you do this, the more likely it is that that channel is going to, going to grow. So the other thing to point out about this is that we say ideal advocate profile. It's probably more like profiles. There's, there's different people uh, in the organization. So um, I'm going to pause there, Lewis. Does that, does that kind of resonate or make sense at this point? It does resonate and it's getting me quite excited because like you said, I haven't seen this yet um, and the creative juices are already flowing for uh, pieces of content for the website. So um, yeah. Okay, as, long as, as long as I get yeah. credited, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then it's all good. Um, yes. So this is basically, uh, you know, was originally an Excel spreadsheet been dropped onto a PowerPoint file. So like I said, if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm sure it wouldn't take you two seconds to to yeah recreate this yourself. Uh, but if you want to download it, it will be available in in the show notes. So when we the first so let's go top left over to over to the right. So first of all, the who the who isn't a specific person. Uh, I mean, it could be if it was the CEO as an example. Um, but let's say the first. In fact, Lewis, why don't you give me one? Because I would I mean I would straight away I'll say the sales team because I always do. So. So not a particular person, just a... A group of people inside an organization. So let's say, for instance, you're a company, you've got 5,000 employees, you've got loads of divisions, loads of countries, loads of disciplines within the company. Um, and let's say your objective is to create inbound inbound web traffic. Mm -hmm. So let, let's start thinking about a group of people in the company that you think would be beneficial to that. I mean, it might be slightly broad if I just say the marketing team. Um, mm -hmm. But let's let, let's go with the marketing team just to fine keep it easy. So, so the first the, the the who is the group of people that we've said are going to be our ideal advocate profile, and I would recommend that people try and do you know four or five of these, and then put them in order of which one they think is going to give them the the most return for the effort, uh, the investment of the effort. So the who would be the marketing team, the business objectives, and north star. Um, I use the word North Star a lot and I, I used it on a call the other day and someone said it was the first time they ever heard the phrase North Star used and I don't know whether I've just heard it and reused it so many times. Um, okay, on a recent episode of the podcast, you used the phrase, what was it, Sanity Check? Yeah, and you I didn't remember. know that either. But, I, but North Star is... Yeah, someone said to me, so oh, universal. Like, they're like, where's that from? And I was like, the North Star, like... It's from the, the brain of Bradley Keenan. Yeah, exactly. But <laughs> so, so yeah, so the North Star and business objectives for marketing is what? I'm oh, sorry. I, I forget yeah. this is a, like a, a live Q&A. Yeah. Uh, North Star generating inbound leads. Okay. So now we want to look at the pain points of that individual person to achieve in those North, North, that, that North Star. So for marketing, what are the pain points for generating, uh, you know, new, new leads? Oh goodness me! Um, okay, let's let's I try not to keep it too specific. I want, I want to the marketing our... team to well, we can do it for us for real, right? So if I say I want to double the inbound inquiries we get every single day, what's the pain point to getting you there? Um, I'd say we probably need to put more of an emphasis on on SEO so that our discoverability is a little bit higher um, or is elevated at least, so that we can get these leads to our website. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, obviously, we're doing a lot with organic social and we use our own platform. So we're using an employee advocacy tool. That for me is a, is a, pain, point, a pain point at the moment. I want to be ranking top when people are searching for employee advocacy. Okay. So first page, search engines and first result. So that is the what's happening. The pain point to getting you there is like res res resources and budget, right? Sure. If I, if I yeah, said to you, you have unlimited budget to dominate social, then of course you can do it. Mm. Um, buy up all the keywords, da, 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 you're there, right? So the pain point becomes, like you said, you want to be more visible and more visible in different places. But ultimately, budget is a consideration in, in doing that. So now how does disseminate help with that as a pain point? With discoverability or... It on search engines or are we talking well, generating about generating generating inbound inquiries so the the oh, business objective is generating inbound inquiries the pain point is 
Um, we want to be, we want more exposure, SEO, uh, anywhere else. Um, but budgets are an issue. Uh, we don't have un- unlimited funds. Sure. Um, so now how does, how does getting somebody in the marketing team help us achieve our North Star? So Disseminate helps with that because it's increasing your, your visibility on social media. It's increasing your reach and ultimately your, your brand awareness through your employees. Okay. And then to do that, if we want to generate inbound inquiries, what would our content preferences be? From experience, I'd say case studies are particularly effective. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Case studies and success stories seem to be the most valuable, I would say. Great. So then a key stakeholder in that team of people. So we've got a marketing team. Um, in order to get that marketing team to be active in our, I mean, forgetting that we are an employee advocacy program, let's assume, let's pretend we weren't. We want to en- we want to engage everyone in our marketing team to be part of our advocacy program. Um, who's the who's the key stakeholder in who could basically? When I say key st- stakeholder, I always think about it as someone who can someone who can say no when everyone says yes, right? So who would that person be in our organisation? Oh, it would be Jody, VP of Marketing. Yeah. So now we've got our first ideal advocate profile. So we now do that for, you know, the whoever, the sales team, because we want to sell more products, the engineering team, because we need to attract more engineering talent. Um, and we build this ideal advocate profile out. But the key part of it is having those key stakeholders because they are the gateway to that group of people. Um, so there's two parts of it. There's who's the gateway to that group of people? And how am I going to communicate with that individual to show them why this should be important to them? And it's always, you know, I'm always complaining about this, but it's marketing 101 to focus on the value to the person that you're selling to and not the value to, to yourself. It would be like it would be like Apple announcing a new MacBook and saying, please buy this MacBook because we will make more money. <laughs> right. It's exactly the same thing. But. If you launch your advocacy program saying to people, please join our advocacy program because it's really going to help me and then wonder why no one wants to join it, then you probably shouldn't work in marketing. So with this, what you're able to do is say, hey, Jody, we've 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 identified 20 people in your marketing team because we really want to help you drive more inbound leads. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to curate specific content which helps engage prospective buyers such as case studies social proof blah 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 and we're going to make it super simple for them to do it by giving them an app that only requires you know uh, a small a small fraction of time in some cases it can be completely ambient and they don't even need to to be in the program it, jody is that something that would be of interest to you of course it is and then jody's then acting as part of your team to bring that group of people on and the engineering team the proposition might be we're trying to develop uh, our sprints. We're trying to get our sprints to be um, uh, we're, we're trying to get more out of our, our sprints. So we need more development resource. And the pain point is we can't attract the right talent. So if your engineers start helping us share the content, we're going to attract more talent. It's going to it's going to give us more bandwidth, which means that the developers can focus on um, innovation as much as, uh, you know, the core maintaining of a product or whatever. Um, so that messaging is very different to the engineers than it is, is for the marketing team. Um, so I think doing this exercise kind of gives people that ability to have that blueprint to always go back to. So when someone says, well, why should I? The answer is real and it's not just, oh, because I want you to. For sure. And just so that I'm understanding this, are you essentially approaching the key stakeholder first to say, this is something I want to do? I want you on board, but are you kind of communicating with them? It's like you have this weight within the team to really Mm -hmm. get this thing off the ground. Yeah. um, There's a bottom up and a top down approach to this. So often that's a very common question we'll get is like, should I launch this with the entire company or should I do it in more of a modular test and learn way? Um, So we, as a company, we kind of have the view that you should just do both. Um, because if you invite enough people, enough percentage of people are going to join it. Um, but also you want to be more intelligent about how, how you launch it. So, but personally, I would say that you should launch with a sizable amount of people, but you should do it in a modular and thoughtful way. So if I was launching an employee advocacy program and I was in a company that had say 10,000 employees, as an example, um, I would pick, 
I would do my ideal advocate profile. I'd look at which one aligns with the company objectives the most because that's going to give me the ability to get senior level buy-in. So for instance, let's say a company is under a lot of pressure at the moment because their um, diversity and inclusion is way off of where it needs to be. And it's a fundamental business strategy that the CEO has announced and said that they need to sort, you know, they need to fix. That would be my priority. And my group, my team of people would be, you know, ambassadors for diversity and inclusion within the organization with with recruitment as the goal. Um, And then as I grew that program, I would bring in um, new groups of people, but I would communicate with them in the way that they want to be, you know, spoken to. Um, And I think for marketeers, then it's like someone emailing you out of the blue with a template email that doesn't address your specific pain points, doesn't talk about your industry, just says, hey, you're a pulse in a checkbook. Like, do you want to buy my product? Which, you know, most marketers would say they don't like it when that happens. I think that's why this resonates with me so much and why I'm so excited about it, because I get cold emails like that all the time. It's like, uh, it would just be... Oh, you spoke to me about one recently saying, somebody emailed you saying, are you looking for new clients at the moment? No, are you open to taking on new clients at the moment? Are you open? As, it, yeah. As if you're going to like, it's the most obvious thing. It's like, a yes, of course, but you've given me no value. You haven't touched on my pain points um, or anything. You know, you haven't explained to me how you're going to help with it. So, so this um, is a real example of this, right? So we're always debating around and, and I, you know, I'm always debating people LinkedIn about it. Um, does email work for sales? And it does. Right. Deliverability is a massive issue, right? You need to actually be able to deliver the email. And then people talk about personalization. Um, to me, personalization is creepy. So if someone sends me an email and goes, hey, Brad, I noticed on uh, Instagram you were recently in Ibiza. I went to it. I'm like, who are you and why are you looking at my Instagram? It's weird. Um, as where I got an email last week, which um, is it's a software Um specifically addressing something that is like a tier one challenge for me right now. So they very clearly said, when we speak to founders like you, they, they have this problem. Do you have that problem? If you do, we have the solution. It's pretty much as simple as that. I'm immediately like, yeah, I'm open to it. No, in fact, I didn't immediately book a demo. I sent them a couple of questions back because there was specific considerations. They answered them. We did a demo looking like maybe we probably will start using the software no personalization but what they did was they got straight to why i should give a shit about that right now um and they they're victorious because of it that's interesting because i have a i agree but i also kind of i rate the personality or sorry the personalization that people add it depends on how personalized it is if somebody's just said the one that always gets me is because our company name on our company names disseminate but on linkedin it's disseminate the employee influence platform it's very obvious when somebody's yeah. used a personalization token when they say hey lewis and i've got a thunderbolt in my linkedin name so that sometimes pulls through yeah. uh i was recently why checking the thunderbolt? out why the, pardon why the thunderbolt mine's a snowboard because i like snowboarding why oh initially it? it was just to, to stand out but now i've realized there's this uh you're lightning quick when you do things yeah i'm lightning fast that's, okay. that's literally it um no, there's this, uh, I've forgotten where he works. It's Monzo, the social media manager for Monzo. Um, I think he's brilliant on LinkedIn. I wish I could name him. Uh, but his name escapes me, but he recently posted about this. it. Pardon? You can tag him in this. He got a mention. Yeah, I don't know if that's based, based on what I've seen from his LinkedIn feed. I don't know if that's what he's, he's not that's what he's after. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, he's not. I don't think he's pro, um, uh, I don't know, engagement baits. But either way, I'll give him, I'll give him his kudos. Um, right. Because he's fantastic and the, the content he puts out is great. But also he mentioned recently about having emojis in your name and that kind of thing and how it is a quick identifier for bad personalization, LinkedIn messages and automations and that kind of thing. I don't knock it. I respect the hustle. But at the same time, it is good to know. It is good to have it. So when people reach out to me and say, hey, Lewis Gray, Lightning Bolt, uh, I noticed Disseminate, the employee influence platform on LinkedIn is doing X, Y, and Z. And it's sorry the point that i was trying to get to is when people really personalize it i do think the instagram thing is a bit creepy like oh i noticed your wife recently went to a hindu and like you drove her there or something crazy yeah. like that it's obviously way too i was far. recently recently rustling through your bins and i noticed <laughs> that you like eating apricot wheats for breakfast uh, i also like a fruit-based uh, cereal <laughs> So you binoculars go, oh, well, of the window. Who just... are you? I need to buy something from you. What do you sell? <laughs> I, I I barely care. Here's, here's the PO. 
but no, I have. I've been on the receiving end of the the other like, of the other end of that as well, where it's uh, it's not personalized, but it's just mm-hmm. so bang on the money. And yeah, in this yeah. case, it was very timely as well. So I I didn't even reach out as booked a demo. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing is, with with this, it's that idea that like, and I've said this before, that employee advocacy isn't new, right? I mean, when I invented it. Um, and then realized that there was already like 10 companies doing it. I thought it was new. And then you're like, oh, hang on a minute. How many, how many years have people been doing this? And it goes back to 2007, right? So there's loads of people who've been doing employee advocacy for a long time. But to be honest, there's loads of people who've been doing it really badly and not thinking at all about the person who you're serving, which is the user and giving them a reason to come back. So I think in the same way as people would, you know, like, Okay, as marketeers would kind of uh, have a go at salespeople for not personalizing, not thinking about them. You've got to do the same thing with the people you're inviting to. Basically, you're inviting someone to have an app as part of their life and you're not going to pay them for doing it. And if you don't take the time to kind of frame why this is valuable to them and why they would do it, um, then you are literally going to be working on, uh, you know, just law of averages. So then you invite 10,000 people, you're going to get a few hundred um, but if you do this, um, you're going to see like significantly higher uh, adoption rates. 100%. Yeah. And I think especially when the underlying motive is this is going to benefit me, mm-hmm. you know, ultimately you're launching the the program because there's some sort of goal that you, you want to hit. So you have to take the time to personalize it. And I think this, what you're showing us, Brad, and again, you can download this in the show notes, but does a it does do a brilliant job of kind of identifying, helping you to identify those points so that you can really hone in on their pain points when you're reaching out to your your advocates or your potential advocates obviously this is to get them on board but question then just on that at what point during the i guess the launch process when are you when are you going through this this process so this would be no sorry this is pre-launch this is before you would even build an employee advocacy program this is part of like a kpi and kind of stakeholder alignment uh, piece so what we find and have found in the past is that um you know a sales cycle for enterprise software is you know usually you know 90 to 100 days if it's less than that you know good for you um but often it's going to be around that period of time and it could be longer it could be a year i think we've had people we've been speaking to for two years that became clients um now what happens is sometimes on that stakeholder kickoff there's not a single person that was on the demo so it can be that you know they know that launching an employee advocacy program is a strategic initiative um but actually they weren't really in the first part of the sales process they've now got this thing that they've got launched so we do this stakeholder alignment thing where it's a big workshop lasts an hour all the key people on it and we use we actually have this as you know empty on screen so we we go for it, we talk about it and discuss and, and, you know, then after the meeting, there would be some back and forth where we kind of complete it. Um, and then that's kind of used as the framework then to start to build the program, you know, the topics, the groups and all those kind of things. Understood. Okay. Yeah. I almost feel like I'm digging so that I can produce this piece of content uh, a bit better. Um, but what was not- great is we did a call last week um, with a really fast growing gaming company um like insanely fast growing um and they basically had it already it was great so yeah we were talking about the ideal advocate profile and they had already done the work they hadn't called it ideal advocate profile but they had they had already kind of put it into these these uh buckets of people that they thought was of value so the fact that they had already done it prior to call to me um you know i can guarantee that they'll be successful for for years to come because you know that to me is like the uh is it green flag the opposite to red flag um it yeah big green flag for me because i was like yes uh, you're you're actually thinking about this yeah that's um that's something that's surprising me and something that i'm seeing more and more now you know we 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 have we've heard about this over the past couple of years gartner predicted that by 2023 it's like 90 percent of b2b organizations would be using employee advocacy as part of their overall marketing strategy but i'm seeing it now the amount of companies that i'm talking to or sales calls that I'm listening to or clients that I'm speaking with who are kind of saying, we were already aware of this. We just needed to find something to do it, you know, find a tool that would help us do it in a, you know, in regulated industries, they'll often say in a compliant way. Um, But it's cool to see more and more people are doing this work ahead of time. They recognize Mm -hmm. how to do it. 
they just need the you know the right tool so it's like they're coming with with all the goods it's almost you know it's almost less work to do on our side which is is. never a bad thing i've worked in so the two companies that i was involved in prior to this one were both early um were, were both pre-market if that makes sense so they were they were products before people knew that they needed the product so the first was um product video content um and that was in 2003 so we're talking basically pre-youtube um and what you go through is this phase of the you know i always say it was like the what what is this right so if you're going around selling something to someone and they're all saying what is this you're probably a little bit too early because people haven't allocated budget for it um then it's the so it'll be the what and then it would be why like why would i do this then it becomes who am i going to do this with which is like vendor selection and then the really good bit which i think is now is the how so how am i going to do this better how can i level up and like i always compare this to email just because it's like a you know thing i follow a lot on 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 linkedin but Everyone knew you should send prospective emails a few years ago and then everyone did it. Now you've got to be really good at it to get to get good at it. And I think now mm. we're seeing those people that are actually totally leveling up on how they do employee advocacy, which for us is obviously, a, you know, a big, um, a big win and something we, we love to see. Yeah, and it only brings new ideas our way, I feel, as well. and almost helps with, I dare say, with product development too, because, you know, you come with your own ideas and... Uh, I don't know. It's like you said, they're not being told why they need to do this or how they need mm. to do this. They recognize they need to. It's just, you know, let's let's crack on. Um, but I remember, I think it's four years ago now, writing blog posts and things like that on what is employee advocacy. That would It would be such a colossal waste of time for me to do that now because it's just not something that we have to communicate. Mm. Um, maybe I'm just getting sentimental here and a bit off topic, but it's just, uh, it, it's it's great to see that it's kind of, come such a long way since we were you know i think the challenge the challenge with stuff like that though is if you i think early adopters can sometimes get burnt so it's like you tried something eight years ago it didn't get the results um and you know we're all human so we'll always we you know generally we'll blame external factors for why something didn't go away you know it's like if someone's hugely successful it's because they're a genius if uh, they're not successful it's because of the markets right so the same way happens with tech you go oh we did employee advocacy seven years ago it didn't work well okay maybe you didn't do employee advocacy in the right way because you just weren't thinking about it maybe the tech wasn't good enough so um so, yeah, I, I mean, I feel like even though we're seven years in and other people are, you know, 15 years in or more, um, the market now is only really starting to, to mature. Uh, 100%. Kind of um, that expert level. I mean, as a vendor as well, we were learning pain points back then too. So, you know, even our products come such a long way from what it would have been for seven years ago, you know, whenever. Mm. It's evolved with, with the market. I mean, um, even when I built the vid- original MVP, I remember saying, uh, saying to Ryan, to be honest, I said, like, to be honest, I think the simplicity of it means we'll never need to add another feature to this. <laughs> uh, yeah, seven years later, uh, non-stop development. Um, and I'm still going, at what point do we stop adding things into this? Um, I just but, wrote a press release last week for a new feature. Yeah, yeah, it won't <laughs> stop. Amazing. Um, Brad, I've, again, like super enjoy these workshops. Like I say, I take away a lot from these. Um, I hope everybody else does too. And like Brad mentioned, please do download the uh, the PowerPoint version of this. Um, Brad, I want to hand over to you so that you can summarize this. Obviously, it's, you know, it's your episode, your topic. So I'll let you kind of go through any key takeaways here. Yeah, thanks, man. Um, yeah, so I, I guess the key take- takeaway from me is just to, as I've said in many other episodes before, think about the advocate as your customer and that your job as the program leader is to onboard them by selling them the value. And the way that you do that is by focusing on them as individuals and, um, you know, not see everyone as the, as the same character and who, who they're going to be as part of your ad- advocacy program. Awesome. Yeah. And from my side, I genuinely can't wait to start sharing this. Uh, I think it's super valuable. Um, just a, a slightly different end to this episode because we've neglected to do it in the past, but obviously if you do have the time to just leave us a review on wherever you're listening to this podcast, um, I listen to all of mine on Spotify, so I know it's super easy. Uh, it takes a couple of seconds. Just hit that 
I was about to say hit that five star. I don't want to lead you, but please do hit that five star. Obviously, it's a it's a huge help for us. But um, yeah, wherever you listen to your podcast, do just give it a thumbs up or a, a like or a, or a rating. And just um, as a side note to that, if you are going to use ChatGPT to write the review for you, um, do read it before you post it because <laughs> we had somebody give us a review the other day. It wasn't on the podcast; it was a different thing. Um, and the, the review started with, um, I am a, you know, I'm an AI generated thing and I can't give opinions. And it basically, it showed that they'd just gone, ChatGPT, write me a review for Disseminate. <laughs> it's, it's I saw that. I literally saw that this morning. It was brilliant. <laughs> I mean, we got five stars, so I took it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So again, if you want to do that, by all means do. If we get the five stars, we are we are more than happy. But of course, we do hope you enjoyed the episode. But um, yeah, as I say, all resources will be in the uh, show notes below. Um, if you want to reach out to myself or Brad, you can do so on LinkedIn. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening. We'll, we'll catch you next week. Bye.